So I thank the organizer to have made some special effort that I could come here. Uh, so, and uh, I will try uh, to discuss uh, the history of critical exponents. In fact, I have discovered while preparing the talk that it would take two hours instead of one. So I will certainly have to skip a few things otherwise, and we'll see how it proceeds. Okay, but just let me make a philosophical remark. Uh, also, I have written everything because I didn't know how well I would perform. So the, the precise, precise determination of critical exponents of the Ising model and also a, a family of other models has been an obsession of physicists for about, let's say, 70 years. Beyond its success, research which has produced exponents with a determination of almost unphysical, I should say, of unphysical precision, has established a direct relation between critical phenomena in statistical physics and quantum field theory. It, had, it has led to a new and profound understanding of the concept of renormalization group and the meaning of quantum field theory, which is strange renormalization procedure. Nowadays, it's generally accepted that quantum field theory is only, and I should have said, an effective low energy theory, and that the non-mean field, like exponent and critical phenomena, as well as the ultraviolet divergence of quantum field theory, are simply a consequence of the non-decoupling of scales. The renormation group leads to method to deal with this issue. Okay, so that's... Uh, okay, so <laughs> now let me go slight fast through history. Uh, as you probably all know, the first try to give a, a meaning to explain universality of critical phenomena and to give uh, general features of the theory of critical phenomena uh, was mean field theory or different determinations with, under the same name, and it was formalized by Landau uh, in 1937. Okay, so the, the <coughs> The, the family of phenomena one has in mind are continuous phase transition. And the important point is that in the Ising model and as other class of continuous transition with short range interaction, they are characterized by the divergence of the correlation length. And therefore, which is much larger, there is, therefore, near the critical temperature, there are two lengths in the problem, one which is a microscopic length, lattice spacing for the Ising model, and the other one which is vastly different, which is a correlation length. And the phenomena we are interested in are when we are very close to the critical temperature, and therefore the correlation length is much larger than the lattice spacing. Now, <coughs> this is a situation which is frequent in physics, and generally, and that is the base of Landau theory. One thing that when two scales in, in a problem are vastly different, uh, here the correlation length and the microscopic scale, the lattice spacing, then one can forget about the macroscopic structure and one can describe phenomena with a few set of variables, a small number of variables, which are adapted to the large distant physics. For instance, if I look at this table, which is the only thing I can see in front of me, this table, you don't have to write the Hamiltonian of the table to describe the property of the table. You can say, well, it, it has some, some strength, it has some size, and like that, but nothing, you are not interested, and you don't care about the macroscopic structure. And that's the basis of lambda theory. Uh, and this was also the outcome of the mean field approximation. Okay, therefore, one should be describing phenomena just in terms of uh, uh, the, the distance to the critical temperature, the magnetization, and the field, and that's about it. And so just uh, also I want to remind you, because I will frequently make reference to critical exponents. Uh, most of you are familiar with them, but let me just, since I'm discussing exponents, remind you what this is about. Okay, so. Uh, so, in, in Landau theory, you, you consider the thermodynamic potential density, which is a macroscopic object with, in case of Ising, Ising symmetry. And near the transition, uh, 
and everything is, should be regular. Every for, everything you write down should be regular function of the deviation of the temperature, the magnetization, the magnetic field, and whatever. Okay, so here it's just uh, the thermodynamic potential. There is a first term which induces that phase transition, which is a term which is quadratic and uh, which is proportional to the deviations from the critical temperature. And of course, this means plus order t minus t squared, which I don't write. There is a term m to the fourth, m to the sixth, and so on. Yes. And the domain of validity is supposed to be First, these two quantities are positive, otherwise you don't have a second order phase transition, and you are very close to the critical temperature. Now, the deviation, the, <coughs> the, the magnetization is obtained by differentiating uh, in zero field by differentiating with respect to the magnetization, and therefore you get the famous square root behavior, the magnetization proportional to the square root of t minus t c, and therefore the exponent, which is called beta, is one half. Okay. So the only thing you have to remember is that beta is one half. Okay. If you apply an external field, then the equation of the equation of state is h equals dg over dm. So you have equals but we just differentiate. You need you keep only m and m cube. And already quite early, Widom had conjecture of the scaling form, and this is something which has been confirmed by renormalization group that h should be m to the delta times a universal function of t minus tc over m over 1 over beta in the domain of m h t minus t small. And the mean field approximation delta is 3, and the function is a linear function. Okay, and finally, <coughs> still in the mean field approximation or in Landau theory, the two-point correlation function in Fourier component has a Einstein Zanke form, so it's just what in quantum field theory we call the free field the uh, 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 propagator. It's one of a p square plus some coefficient, and here there are some parentheses. There is uh, some absolute value missing, but the absolute value of t minus tc. Okay. So the exponent gamma character is a divergent of the magnetic susceptibility at zero momentum. Nu is a correlation length exponent. Xi, eta is the scaling dimension of the magnetization. And from this expression, you derive that uh, in space dimension d, uh, the dimension of the magnetization is one half of d minus two plus eta. And uh, therefore, gamma is one, nu equals one half, and eta equals zero. And the specific, which I didn't bother to write, has also an exponent, which is alpha, and which in mean field theory, alpha, it's alpha equals zero. Now, <coughs> the important point for us is that Landau theory, as I just explained, is based on the paradigm of scale de decoupling. Properties can be described without taking into account phenomena as other very different scales. Okay, for instance, also, we don't have to bother about the size of this amphitheater. We don't have to bother about the distance to the moon and things like that, uh, just to describe some macroscopic object around us. This assumption is generally correct, fortunately, because if it would not be the case, then physics would have been essentially impossible, because uh, you, you cannot, you, could, you would need uh, to know the complete exact theory to do anything which is, of course, impossible. But in the 20th century, for the first time, the f two examples were found in which this paradigm was not satisfied, and <laughs> which is relativistic, relativistic quantum field theory, and its problem of ultraviolet divergences, and the properties of critical phenomena near continuous phase transition. It's quite remarkable in two vast, vastly domain different different domain of physics in the same time, more or less. In two domains, you have find the same problem. I, I think, personally, I find this fascinating, I must say. OK, now, in, in the 30s, it was self-believed that Landau theory was more or less correct. Uh, however, the first problem arose in 1944, when Hans Zaga published a partial solution of the two-dimensional easing model. And uh, this and uh, subsequent work yielded non-mean field exponents 
alpha equals zero, beta equals one half, gamma equals equal seven over four, nu equals one, delta equals 15, eta is no longer vanishing, was no longer vanishing, but one quarter. Now, all this result contradicted mean field approximation and Landau theory. And uh, after that, there was a number of physicists made numerical investigation into in three dimensions to understand really the issue. In particular, when I was a student, I remember that some of the older colleagues, they thought that maybe the Ising model is really special. The reason, because you can solve it, is necessarily special. That's obvious. And therefore, that maybe this was just an awkward feature of a very peculiar model. And this was not necessarily contradicting mean field theory. Of, as a, however, so as a result, uh, since one couldn't find any solution in three dimensions, uh, no exact solution, one started doing, using numerical investigation to see whether, you, which were as first high temperature series, and later Monte Carlo simulation, to see whether uh, this, uh, there was agreement or disagreement with the mean field theory. Okay, now I will just flash through the uh, high temperature expansion, not that I don't like it, but just because I have realized that presumably I will never go to the end if I do it. And uh, <coughs> in case I would be able to complete my task before I would come back to the high temperature expansion because it's interesting. Okay, now the idea is very simple. Uh, let's say I just write uh, uh, the partition form contribution to the partition function of the Ising model. So S is plus or minus one. Uh, and this is a neighbor, just neighbor interaction. It's clear that at high temperature you can expand, expand this exponential, and then you have to calculate some kind of class, some peculiar type of diagrams uh, to make the, to sum of the Ising spins. The first terms you could, can do by hand, and eventually you need a computer to go on. And this was the calculation we initiated by Dom and Sykes in the beginning of the 60s. And then uh, once you have a series in one over t, and since you, if you believe that, uh, let's say this is a partition function, but you will take expectation values instead, then you believe that these quantities have a singularity at the critical temperature, then you use the uh, uh, approximants applied to the logarithmic derivative of the so-called ratio method to try to figure out the critical exponents. And just... Uh, uh, one point which is interesting, uh, except for the techniques to do that, is that uh, shortly, uh, since a colleague had at the time had in mind the exponents of the Ising model, uh, they started thinking that in three dimensions, critical exponents will be rational numbers. And therefore, uh, when they did the numerical high temperature series expansion analysis, they figure out that the exponent should, could, could be 1.25 for gamma, 5 fourths, alpha equals 1, 8, and beta equals 6, 6, 5 or 16, because this more or less was an agreement with a analysis of, of rather short series. Okay. And this totally confused them because this was a constant bias in the analysis of the high temperature series. So they're trying, they're really trying to find out these numbers. Okay. So let me just, uh, that's, uh, so uh, the, the, the before renormalization group or that time of renormalization group, the, the claim was gamma was one two hundred fifty plus or minus three. Uh, no, uh, these numbers were well in agreement with the Russian number I gave you. Okay, now uh, since this, then, then they contested saying that uh, renormalization group results were wrong, essentially. Okay, and so I, I, I commit myself a paper for which the expert in high tensile theory claimed that I was totally incompetent to do that, uh, and to try to figure out one of the main issues and which made this analysis biased is that they didn't realize that there was a confluent singularity at TC <coughs> with an exponent theta, which is essentially a four to one half, which was much larger then the next correction in T minus TC, while they thought that this was an expansion in T minus TC. Okay, and if you do this and you, you are a little bit more sophisticated, you find results which are more or less consistent with the normalization group. Okay, and I will not. Uh, 
And so these are the most recent results, 2002, or maybe the most recent, I'm totally sure. But you see that nowadays, that I, you will see that they are essentially in agreement with renunciation. Also, there was a controversy on the so-called hyperscaling relation. Alpha, the specific exponent, equals 2 minus d nu, d is the dimension. Uh, <coughs> there was a claim that this was not obeyed by atom theory, theory, while in quantum field theory or in renormalization group, it comes out, out automatically. And so, the, again, this was a consequence of, bias, of a bias analysis of two short series. Okay, but uh, <coughs> let so so the <coughs> it took some time to realize that the failure of mean field theory uh, was a effect of non decoupling of scales because this was such a bizarre phenomenon. Even though it has been it had been observed in quantum field theory and led to the problem of renormalization, uh, renormalization the status of renormalization quantum field was obscure. Okay? It was kind of a magic trick to transform something which was infinite with some cutoff in something finite. And the, the deep meaning of renormalization was not understood. Okay? And therefore, <coughs> and it was not realized that it was an effect also of non decoupling of scales. Okay? Now, in, 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 in static physics, it took some time also to digest the information. And finally, starting more or less with Kadanov in 66, it was realized that maybe there's a problem of decoupling of scale. And then if you have this problem, then what do you do? Okay. Uh, if, if really everything is coupled on all scales, you see you may face a situation that nothing is predictable. Okay. And the fantastic, the, the, the first, the invention of this method based on renormalization group, and the fact that it came to the, they led to the notion of fixed points, allowed to understand that even though the scales are not decoupled, nevertheless, you don't need all the information which is encoded in microscopic phenomena. Okay? So it's something which purifies the amount, enormous amount of information which you don't know even in general, and uh, tell you just that there are few features you have to remember. And if you remember which are of a microscopic nature, and if you forget this, then you are totally wrong. Okay, so that's, uh, uh, and I think it's, for, uh, to my taste, that's absolutely beautiful. Okay, and this explains why we have been able to make prediction, even though we don't have to know the details of the Microsoft models. And this, this is also the reason why we have, we have found universal, universality of critical phenomena. But mean field theory or mean field approximation is super universal. It depends essentially on nothing. While here, it depends on some features, microscopic features, but only a finite number of them, which you have carefully to transport from the microscopic model to the macroscopic physics. Now, <laughs> of course, at this point, uh, this is talking. Uh, of course, Kadanov approach on the with decimation of the easy model. First, it was only peculiar to the easy model, and in fact, it worked only in one dimension, so it was a little bit naive. However, it inspired Wilson a few years later, and <clears throat> so this idea was. It was not formulated like that initially, but more it became in this form. It was to start with a Gaussian, a Boltzmann weight, which was a Landau Hamiltonian, the one I have described before. And you, following this idea of Kadanov, he proposed to integrate iteratively over short distance modes of the or the parameter of the field and look for fixed points. And uh, this analysis, when it was performed close to four dimension, and uh, you see here there was a, a miracle. The miracle was that at the same time this problem right, was start to one start to study this problem. In the other branch of physics, in particle physics, the <coughs> dimensional continuation in dimensional regularization had been invented, so that speaking about four 
3.99 dimension was not so awkward anymore. Okay, otherwise, so Wilson, of course, knew about that. And so <laughs> with Fisher, they analyzed this fixed point, this iterative equation, this flow equation in the neighborhood of four dimension. And they came up, and this is what then at the time I was a little bit less than a student, now I was a young postdoc. Uh, <coughs> uh, they came out first with uh, an expansion to one or, or first only in epsilon which for gamma gave 1 plus 1 six of epsilon and for epsilon 1 this is 1.17 and even later the calculation of all the epsilon square and this gave gamma equals 1.244 and remarkably enough it was very close to the conjecture value of 1.25 okay so one could think that uh, one it didn't in, uh, one uh, five quarter was not wrong and that the epsilon expansion would converge toward this value because the three take the three first looks very convergent okay. of course it it would be wrong but uh, we'll come back in a second so uh, uh, first uh, the conclusion which came out from this analysis of short integra integration of short uh, more modes associated to short distance uh, <coughs> was the, and the, the, the conjecture that there would be <coughs> which was found in this case <coughs> of a fixed point led to the notion of universality <coughs> of critical behavior but within universality classes the second point is in the within the framework of epsilon expansion it appeared that mainly in the London Ginsburg uh, Hamiltonian, uh, Wilson Hamiltonian, the only term which was really important was phi to the four. Okay. And therefore, uh, for those like me who had learned about quantum field theory, this uh, was striking for us because four dimension and uh, in ultra and <coughs> The fact that you need some kind of renormalization framework was exactly what has been invented for curing the infra ultraviolet divergence of quantum field theory. And uh, more or less what they had done by stopping at phi to the fourth at this order was that this <laughs> pointed to our perturbative renormalization group, which was the renormalization group of quantum field theory, and that could be, uh, which could be adapted after some proper scaling to the statistical problem. And uh, the fixed point equation in this framework, in the framework of quantum field theory, was reduced to find the zeros of the so-called Galan-Zeman sig-beta function. You see, one thing <coughs> which was puzzling at the beginning, because one has to think about rescaling, is that uh, quantum field theory was an issue of large momentum divergences. Uh, statistical physics was infrared divergences. Okay. And so it took a some time, okay, let's say empirically, for calculating by in epsilon expansion exponent, it looked to give the same result. However, why was it exactly so? Okay, and so for some time we were puzzled, and instead in, until we realized that it's a question of rescaling. You may decide that you take to set into the microscopic scale to be one, and everything <coughs> is built. Or you may decide that the micro scale is very small or very large, macroscopic scale. If it's in momentum space, is a cutoff, which is very large, and physics is of order one. But you have just to shift it. But if you calculate ratios, it doesn't matter, the two problems are equivalent. Okay, but uh, <coughs> now it's trivial. But at the time, it was quite puzzling. But we did the calculation anyway. So now, <coughs> let me just remind you <coughs> why eventually well, <coughs> the uh, quantum field theory framework was the proper one to deal with this issue. Uh, <coughs> so, and this was uh, uh, analyzed the free field theory, the massless free field theory is a Gaussian fixed point. That's very simple to verify. You make a rescaling, renormalization group transformation, it remains always the same. 
Okay. Now, <laughs> the role of dimension four in the di fight to the four in dark is that what <laughs> one had to understand. But you realize that dimension four is a dimension in which phi to the four theory is renorm just renormalizable with the phi to the four interaction. So it cannot be a coincidence. <laughs> so the result, <laughs> the idea was then uh, to study, to start from this fixed point and to start, study, study the important perturbation to this fixed point. Now, if you do that, that's just uh, dimensional analysis. You discover that essentially uh, there is one term, one <coughs> monomial. We, we only discuss local monomial because we are always thinking about short distance interaction, okay? Short, short range interactions. That's why we only discuss local theories. Okay, and so uh, <coughs> you verify immediately that phi square is always so-called a relevant perturbation, which means that if you add a phi to the first term, you get away from the fixed point, and that is clear because you change the critical temperature. Uh, <coughs> when, uh, if instead you find that like phi to the fixed in four dimension, uh, <coughs> the term is so-called irrelevant perturbation, then you can forget about it in first approximation. And then for if you find that the dimension of the operator of the monomial is zero, it's a marginal perturbation, and you have to have to go to a second order analysis. Now, phi to the square is always relevant. Phi to the fourth is relevant for dimension larger than four. It's marginal in four dimension, which is just reflection of the fact that the theory is renormalizable. And uh, for dimension more than four, it's relevant, which means that perturbation theory cannot be easily used because this is the most important term. Okay, you can do all this for the, five, for the three, three critical points, and then you find that dimension three is marginal. Again, here, <coughs> a peculiarity. You see, uh, when you, we are discussing renormalization of quantum field theory, we say, ah, phi to the six is very bad. Okay, up to phi to the four, the theory is renormalizable in four dimensions, but phi to the six, that's a terrible operator. It creates terrible divergences, and so it's very bad. Now, the conclusion here is just the opposite. Say, so phi to the six is irrelevant. You don't care about it. Okay? And again, one had to figure out that this was coming about the, the notion of scale, proper scaling of operators. You see? <coughs> and so, let, let me take just an uh, open parenthesis. Okay. The idea, which was not clear uh, at the beginning in quantum field theory, the idea of quantum field theory for uh, the first generation of physicists was that we were coming to a complete final theory. Uh, quantum field theory should be complete. Okay? We, we should, uh, if we write the complete Lagrangian, that's it. Okay? And therefore, they could not accept the idea that there would be infinities of cutoff anywhere. And due to the magical trick of renormalization, they could read of the cutoff. And when they couldn't, with adding phi to the six or higher dimension operator, they say that's very bad. This term should not exist in the first place. However, now <coughs> you change completely your mind. And I will come back. It's, a, it's coming to the conclusion before proceeding. Okay. Now, in statistical physics, we came about with a different idea. All coefficient in the landau ginzburg whatever I'm doing, which is a general local quantum field theory with any interaction, all the coefficients which are there reflect the microscopic structure. Therefore, they have a scaling dimension, which is proportional to the microscopic, or the, let's say, to the cutoff to some power which is in cutoff is the inverse of the microscopic scale. Okay. And therefore, when a phi to the six is not renormal, as I mentioned, six operator, it is affected by a, a coefficient, which is one over the cutoff square. Because, <coughs> so we, we think nowadays that a quantum field is not a final object. Instead, it's just a so-called effective field theory for describing low energy physics. But the coefficient which appear in the Lagrangian come from the microscopic model, which we don't know. So they have to be multiplied by coefficients, 
which are given by the macroscopic scale and not the microscopic, macroscopic scale. So they should not have as powers, powers of the physical mass, and which then tells you that these terms are terrible. But yet in stem, they have powers of the cutoff, which says, well, they are negligible. Okay. And now that it's more like that, this notion that quantum theory is not a fa 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 fundamental object. It's just an effective theory, and <coughs> one, may, on, one can expand it also in powers of higher dimension operators. <coughs> okay. So here, the conclusion was that finally, uh, at least in the first instance, we could deal with only a phi to the four interaction, provided we study phenomenon very close to four dimension. Okay, four minus epsilon. What happens three dimensions, then this should have been obtained by some extrapolation. Okay. So this was uh, immediately adapted. Ising model in this framework is, is just an example. Okay. So uh, in fact, one started immediately discussing the so-called n-vector model, which is uh, n on symmetric models with n component fields. And uh, <laughs> so one could and that's the advent advantage. You see, uh, in, in high, te high temperature expansion, you to had to take moles one by one and check. Okay, the, in, in once we realized that this was a problem of quantum field theory, then we could, could by the same method, study a lot of problems at the same time. That's, now, <coughs> in, in, uh, n equals one, which is uh, O1, which is just reflection symmetry. This corresponds to liquid vapor phase transition, binary mixtures, and easing model. Okay. N equal two is famous for being the helium superfluid transition. N equal three is it ferromagnetic systems. And uh, very surprising, and that is a piece of the Nobel Prize of Pierre Gilles de Gênes. N equal zero is uh, related to statistical properties of long polymer chains. So uh, once we are in the framework of, uh, of an adapted framework of quantum field theory, of course, it's a quantum field theory. It's not quantum field. It's statistical field theory because we are working in imaginary time. Okay? We have always to, but for what concerns algebraic properties, that's irrelevant. Okay? <laughs> but of course, everything here is positive. <laughs> and we do in the framework of 4 minus d expansion, which is uh, one can, there are two strategies which have been uh, immediately used. One <coughs> is to work in a massless theory, which means at the critical temperature, and then try to study deviation from the critical temperature. And the other one, which is a current framework, which I explain in a second. Okay, so you start from now. The problem is that uh, below four dimension, uh, a massless theory is also always infrared divergent. Okay, that's so easy. A little bit of an, of uh, <coughs> dimensional analysis. Therefore, to do in this framework, it is essential that you work in four minus epsilon dimension. Okay? You cannot do anything in four three point nine nine. It's an expansion in epsilon. And if you think about it, this means that you are changing limits in some obscure way. Okay. So <laughs> therefore here, dimensional continuation uh, regulariza and regularization are essential in the framework. Then you work exactly at, zero, at uh, the critical temperature. And uh, <coughs> you calculate, you construct renormalization group function. And then you add in, in so, in so, you add some deviation from the critical temperature, uh, as, um, and that also needs a little bit of care. Uh, otherwise, uh, you're feeling that everything is in prior divergent. And the fact of adding uh, to the zero, the massless theory, uh, a, a phi square term to change the critical temperature was something which was not immediately understood. And I were, Steve Weinberg, myself, and uh, later Sine Kalman, we were the one who, knew, who understood how to add, to make, to write renormalization group at finite temperature. Okay. Then the, in the, the renormalization, 
the renormalization group equation in the framework of renormalized parameters is exactly what is written here. Okay, so it's a partial differential equation. And uh, <coughs> the whole problem of integrating on short this and blah, 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 and things like that, which was, of course, fundamental to understand the process, reduced to find a fixed point by the zero of a beta function. Okay, and even people before uh, the physicists, the theorists, understood really what they were doing. They understood that beta function must be something in the game, and they started calculating beta function. Okay. And after that, you realize that nobody had really understood what we were doing. But uh, we found the, the problem is that we found, found exactly the same result as this complicated scheme of uh, uh, Winston and Fisher. So, in particular, here in this case, if you calculate at uh, one loop, you find the beta function, which is just eps minus epsilon g plus n plus 8 uh, g squared over 4. Okay? n equal 1 is the easing model. And uh, you see that uh, you have a fixed point, provided that epsilon is positive, in the sense of an epsilon expansion. And then you can start a game of calculating every universal quantity, which includes critical exponents, uh, in terms of a series in epsilon. And in particular, for the critical exponents, you discover also ah, something. You discover that there are only two independent critical exponents, which is obvious in quantum field theory. While in the framework of before in the calculation of a high temperature framework, they didn't, it's impossible to prove. So they had to calculate in every for any new model they had to calculate again. Okay. So and uh, therefore that's the reason why there was this confusion about the hyperscaling relation alpha equals two minus two d because they then didn't know at, that there were only two independent exponents and every, all the other were related. Okay. So, therefore, in this case, all exponents are function are just the values. I'm sorry. The values of these two functions. Here is a beta function. Here is, this is related to the dimension of the field, and this is related to the dimension of the field square. And uh, you just set ten the fixed point value, and you have every. Universal quantities obtained by this. Okay, so that's uh, mechanical. Okay, this, and uh, the sex. Now there was another way, and that's a way, what the, the the method used the Sackley group. Le Guillaume, Raisin, Le Guillaume, myself, we used was to go to the Kalanzima equation because we were at the beginning puzzled by the fact that you had to calculate in these massless theories, uh, everything was infinite divergent and below four dimension, and we were a little bit uneasy about that. So we decided instead to study, uh, to use another scheme, which is a massive theory, which means you are not at criticality, you are close to the critical point only. And m square is the inverse, m is the inverse of the correlation length. Okay. And uh, you, you renormalize the theory in the way we are used to in four dimension, but you can do it now in any dimension because the theory is finite. There is no infinite diverged anymore. Okay. And then you have a so-called Kalanzimansic equation due to Kalanzimansic, okay, which are the way it's written here. They are no longer homogeneous. Instead, there is a second term, uh, uh, right hand side, in which there is the insertion of the phi square operator. Okay. Now, these equations are more difficult to handle because in the uh, critical limit, in the near the critical temperature, you have to show that the right hand side is negligible. Okay. It has an m square, which suggests that it should. But uh, in fact, in four dimension, it's not too difficult to prove. But below four dimension, it's a different issue. In fact, it's true. It's not true order by order in perturbation theory. Uh, and so it's a uh, Nevertheless, we figure out that it should be true. Okay. But, and so this scheme is more complex. Uh, so, as I said, there's a problem of the right hand side. However, the perturbative exp expansion exists in any space dimension and lacks in the mass massless scheme. It's expected for d smaller than 4 beyond perturbation series, the right hand side should be negligible when. Uh, you're approaching the critical temperature. 
the re- unrenormalized, again, this, always this peculiarity, the unrenormalized coupling constant, which means what, some, the, what you have at the beginning in the theory here. Okay, so, so you have a cut. Here. This is a cutoff theory. There's a cutoff which makes everything finite, and then these are the initial parameters given by by God for you. Okay, yeah. God being some uh, microscopic model you know nothing about. Okay. So, so here's the, the subtlety is that. In four, below four dimension, the only divergences you have, ultraviolet divergence in quantum field theory, are coming for the two point function. And therefore, the coupling constant is not renormalizable or normalized. Okay, you just take it. However, as I told you, in reality, U is dictated by microscopic theory. Therefore, it has a dimension, a physical dimension, which is not the mass to the power d minus 4, but the cutoff to the dimension to the power d minus 4. And therefore, even though you don't need to, uh, to renormalize this term, in fact, in, when you go into the, in, the, in, the, in the situation in which momenta and physical mass or correlation length, let's say, are large and uh, distance are large too, then this number, this parameter, in fact, is infinite. Okay. When you have realized that it comes, it has its damage is not given by the renormalized quantities, which is a, a, a physical mass in quantum field, but by the cutoff itself, then you see that it is essentially infinite. So the reason why you're looking, okay, so we I mean, we did the calculation again. I mean, we uh, include myself. We did the calculation of the beta function immediately. We found that the beta function gives exactly what we wanted, the right result, and everything, epsilon expansion. Before we realized we were not sure why we were doing this, because we were claiming that we're interested in momenta much larger than mass, which means uh, this now have, can be translated in distance and correlation angst, if you understand. And in fact, when you look for momenta much larger than m, then you say, ah, this is an ultraviolet fixed point. Okay, That's what you do uh, in, let's say, in QCD or something like that. And now, we, what we were puzzled by is that, in fact, we were looking for an infrared fixed point. Okay, The, the, the ultraviolet fixed point is trivial in below four dimension is just g equals zero. Okay, and this gave the right answer. And we were a little bit until we realized that there is this other hidden parameter, which is a cost, which tells you that in fact this is why this is infinite. G has to go to G star, and indeed, if you recalculate the initial coupling constant U in, as a function of the renormalized coupling constant, you find that it divergence at G star at the zero of the beta function. Okay. Now, finally, there was a, a, a third scheme, which came just shortly later, and this is my own contribution, that, uh, which was uh, only uh, circulated into a preprint and then eventually included in our review with uh, Breza and Zidjust in and Le Guillou in three years later, which is exactly to understand this problem. I reformulated everything in terms of bare parameters, which means initial parameters. And uh, what you can prove is this renormalization group equation, where this is now the coupling constant, which is initially in the theory with the cutoff. The cutoff is now supposed to be changeable. And this exactly reflects this idea of integrating about uh, around short distance modes, like in Wilson and framework. And then you can prove this equation is, is true up to corrections which go down like the cutoff square t- product multiplied by logarithm within the epsilon expansion again, okay, not uh, at fixed dimension. Okay. And if you do that, then this is very close uh, to the scheme of Wilson and company 
except that uh, you have gotten rid of all terms which are decaying like powers of the cutoff. Okay. And the reason why this equation is, is useful Uh -huh. I, I was uh, right in saying that I should. Uh, 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 <coughs> why is the equation useful? Because with this equation, which now makes reference to the microsp microscopic theory, okay, G0 is some copying which comes from the microscopic model. The cutoff is reflection of microscopic structure. Okay, but you, it's not an exact equation. You have neglected terms which have or the land square to every order in perturbation theory, but if you sum them, you don't know whether they don't spoil this equation, but you, you may conjecture. Then you can recalculate physical quantities, which are renormalized parameters, in, ter in terms of the initial parameters. And one of the uh, consequences of this equation, which have, has nothing to do with static physics, is that it shows a so-called triviality problem in the Higgs sector of particle physics. Okay. If you solve this equation in four dimensions, you recalculate the, effect, the renormalized coupling constant in terms of these parameters. You will discover that when the cutoff becomes much larger in the physical mass, then the coupling constant, the renormalized coupling constant goes to zero. Okay. And this was also something which made us discuss intensively with our colleagues in quantum field theory, which couldn't really understand at the beginning trust what we were saying. Okay, but now it's accepted, okay? Because you find that the, the, the renormalized interaction goes like one of a lambda log of cutoff of one physical mass or physical parameter. Okay, and finally, of course, uh, one year later came the complete equation, uh, which is so-called uh, in, in discretized form, it, it's due to Wegener. Then uh, in, in continuous form to Wilson and Wilson published by Wilson and Cogot. And later it was again played with by Polchinski, 10 years later. Okay, and now this equation, if, uh, if you expand it in epsilon, then uh, you find that you recover all the results you have. Uh, and uh, you, if you're interested, you can find a more modern presentation of how to go solve by epsilon expansion this equation. And uh, it, unfortunately, uh, if you want to solve it as such, uh, you can do it only with computers. And there has been some interesting results coming out of it, but not so many. It's too difficult to handle. OK. Let me, so let me just complete, uh, and uh, so I, I will skip for definitively uh, uh, high temperature, so it's an interesting topic uh, from the point of view of uh, understanding the uh, post intellectual process in physics. Uh, <coughs> so once you, when you, once you have the epsilon expansion, you say, aha, now you see, let's take gamma. Uh -huh. Yeah, so gamma is 1 at order, that's mean field. Then uh, it's 1.17, then it's 1.244, and this is where we entered the game. Okay? Uh, so, uh, and everybody was telling us, well, you, you all know it's 1.25, the answer. So we said, uh, okay, now with this modern technology of quantum field theory and uh, dimension regularization, we, we can calculate the epsilon q. It's the last one one can calculate by hand. The other one are too complicated. They have been calculated by computer method, computer algebra. Okay, so uh, with uh, the Sackle group, Brézin, uh, and myself, and independently Bernie Nickel, we calculate this term. And we add it in, and what we got is 1.1948. <coughs> Total design. Well, we were, I mean, totally convinced that we would find something converging to 1.5. Okay? Because everybody telling us, we we know that already. Okay, and even we had difficulties to make let this published. The, the referee refused our article, saying that's nonsense. <laughs> okay, okay, and then uh, using combinatorial algebra, the next term. 
And so uh, from this number, we start realizing that this theory cannot be convergent. We didn't realize fully that they were divergent in mathematical sense, but at least they didn't converge, that for sure, with increasing oscillations. So then came uh, another interesting development following Lipatov. I mean, there had been already for some time uh, studies of the large order of perturbation theory in quantum mechanical models, just simple one-dimensional quantum mechanics okay, <coughs> with uh, polynomial potential, which means quadratic potential, quartic potential. Okay, and then Lipatov came up with the idea that using functional integrals, uh, one could uh, use calculate non-trivial solution of function uh, field equations and extract from them the large order behavior. Okay, that was a remarkable uh, feature, which we had not fully, uh, which I, I think I learned in, in by go, when I went in Russia, and. Uh, and uh, so we said, well, that's absolutely remarkable. Now, this pointed to, oh, to our two directions. You have to realize that in the 80s, still in the 80s, many of the quantum field theorists didn't trust functional integration. Okay? They said, that's just nonsense. Okay? So when I was giving a talk saying, now we take a functional integral, a field integral, I mean, it would be the proper word, uh, and I do this and that, steeple descent, blah, 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 they didn't believe it. Okay, they say, this is, you cannot do it. Nobody understands functions, it doesn't exist. Because indeed, as a mathematical object, it's very difficult to define. That's certainly true. Okay, nevertheless, uh, by, when we study large, for me, it was a piece, an additional piece in trusting functional integration. Okay, so uh, in 3D, in, in four dimensions, easy to calculate for the epsilon expansion, so it's three or n plus eight. Uh, here, for three dimensional perturbative series, I just give uh, the. So it always goes like a k factorial, at all the k. That's the initial feature, and that's true for any instant method for boson. It's not true for fermions. Then there is some number, a to the k, in fact, which is the inverse of uh, some action. Uh, and then it's oscillating for the four to the five theory in this way. Okay, so they are great. So first we understood things. First we understood why this, we had found these uh, stupid results. Okay, and what we should do with that. The theories are divergent for any value of the parameter. Now we know how they diverge, and that's a proper piece of information. <coughs> then we say, aha, Borel summation. Okay, know a little bit of mathematical literature. Yes, and so, so what we did just with well, that, uh, uh -huh. so you take from a function, you divide it by the proper k factorial uh, to make uh, the Borel, to st this is so called the Borel transform. In the, the Borel transform, it's convergent, the series is convergent in a circle. Uh, you, the inverse Borel transform in the sense of power series is given by this integral. Okay, and then you have only as a problem that you know this function in a disk, and uh, this is not sufficient because you have to integrate from zero to infinity. So for this, you have to know the singularities of the function, not only due to the instanton, but everywhere. So we, after thinking about it, we came to the, we guessed, and it's a conjecture, that this function is analytic in a cut circle, in a cut plane, and third, we map the cut plane onto a circle. And then uh, the only thing we can say is that the apparent conversion of the transform theory seems to justify the expansion. Now, Parisi suggested to us that we should not use the epsilon expansion because the series were too short, but we said we could use the current semantic beta function. This is what we did. Okay. And uh, so that's when you do that, well, this is the kind of tables you obtain. Uh, you see that the, exp the exponents are not, uh, they are more than two because we decide always to calculate for all the exponents of so some of the series to verify that we to give, you have to give some apparent errors, which you can never mathematically pinpoint, you cannot prove. So by, if you are too optimistic, you will discover that these numbers do not obey the relations they should. And that's a way of 
making sure that these numbers are not ridiculous. Okay, so that's, and this was published in, these are numbers published in 1980. Okay, and uh, <coughs> I mean, no, were published for the first time in 1980, and in 1998 with Ricardo Guida, we recalculate these numbers. By then we had a more sophisticated method and better computers, and so they're slightly better. Okay. In the meantime, uh, our colleagues were able to calculate the epsilon expansion up to order epsilon to the six. And this gives you, shows that the or epsilon or use the same method, the order epsilon five and epsilon six are now very close. And so this seems to indicate that epsilon expansion is convergent uh, after this treatment. And uh, this is just to give you a compilation of the status of the present status. So this is the numbers by five, five, this perturbation theory in three dimension. That is epsilon expansion, both summed by Borel. This is the high temperature series now from 2000, 2002. These are Monte Carlo, all Monte Carlo is at the most recent Monte Carlo, and this is conformal <coughs> background. And you see that uh, um, just from first sight, these numbers are in very good agreement. It seems only that the phi to the four in three dimension is slightly worse than the, now than the epsilon expansion. Okay, so we are happy. And uh, the, the story. Now, uh, you have to realize that from the physics point of view, you need 1% precision on, on the critical exponent for liquid vapor transition. So we are now beyond we are, what I'm saying. It's unphysical precision now. We, it's, it's for the, the pleasure of theorists that we are doing that. Okay? And just to tell you that one can do also this analysis for the scaling equation of state, which we have we've done also in, uh, in 98, 99 with GIDA, and this gives you this kind of tables. Okay, and I stop here. Thank you for this fascinating account of the theory. Uh, the discussion of the situation of 5-4 field theory in four dimensions based on cutoff brings to mind a distant analogy of uh, Einstein's uh, this explanation of Brownian motion of the pollen particles. The remarkable thing there is that the mathematical continuum theory of Brownian motion is, of course, scale invariant. The uh, but in Einstein's calculation, he used diffusion of pollen particles to actually uh, calculate with reasonable accuracy the Avogadro's number. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a modern analog of that in which some measurement uh, of uh, physical quantity, which is described by 5 4 feet theory, would enable one to determine the small scale uh, structure of the size of the scale at which uh, uh, this other input. Okay, let, let me reformulate your question. Okay, uh, phi to the four not only appears in uh, this framework of statistical physics, but it's an essential ingredient in the standard model of particle physics, where it, it governs the so-called Higgs sector. Okay, nowadays, now, nowadays in the third month, we have a, once we believe in effective field theory, we have a puzzle because the mass of the Higgs, which is of order hammer GeV, is small, comp I mean, is unnaturally small. Even though it looks large, but it's unnaturally small. Because normally you would expect that except by fine tuning, here, the fine tuning means coming close to the critical temperature. Normally, when you're far from the critical temperature, the correlation length is two times lattice spacing or something like that. Okay, so it reflects the lattice spacing. It's only when you fine tune to the critical temperature, you make it divergent and it's much larger. The same, in the, except if God has fine tuned some parameter in the standard model, we expect that the mass of the Higgs reflects the new physics beyond the standard model. 
the macroscopy physics, and therefore should be much larger. So there is a puzzle that this is not so small. So this tells us something about macroscopy, but we don't know what. The only thing is that since we don't believe really in fine tuning, it means that the new scale beyond the standard model should not be too far. Because if it's fine tuning, let's say, if it's a factor 10 below what you would expect, you know there are many parameters they play with and things like that. But if the new physics appears 10 to the 10 times the present scale, okay, like the Planck scale, 10 to the 19 GeV, then this means that it's unbelievable that the mass of the X could be fine-tuned from 10 to the 19 to 10 to the 2. Okay? So it gives you a, 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 the idea that presumably the new scale of physics beyond the standard model, which now we know is only an effective low energy theory, should not be too far. How far? We don't know because then it becomes subjective. Okay, 1% you see uh, it's fine tuning or not, 10 to the 15 is fine tuning, okay? So you, you cannot really, but thing like that. So for physicists like me, even though it's something, uh, something I will never see with my bare eyes, I believe that it makes sense to, to try to construct a new accelerator beyond LHC to explore the 100 TeV scale to see whether we see the new physics appearing. Because I think that's the fine tuning is already a fraction of a percent. It's between 10 to the minus 3 or something like that. So it's not, you cannot really say it's impossible, but you start feeling uneasy, okay, if the physics even much beyond that. So that's the reason why I'm pushing my colleague to try to figure out to work on an accelerator, which is called now the future circular collider, which I will not even see the beginning of the construction. But can you give some rough estimate of the new uh, Avogadro scale? Uh, no, no, no. But yes, I mean, it means, so, <laughs> no, the, I mean, this is the ratio between this new scale we don't know and the present scale of the X mass. Okay, so the day, <laughs> the, the day we find this new scale, uh, then maybe we find some, we have some insight and we understand why it is supposed to be so. The, the new scale is a thousand times the high mass or something like that. But for the present, we don't have the theory, frame, theoretical framework for that. We have just to guess. If you wanted to um, uh, look at magnetism, which would be Heisenberg, and compare the epsilon expansion to the 1 over n expansion, what would win? Oh, the 1 expansion is very bad, unfortunately. Uh -huh. uh, I mean, it's nice because you can do nice calculations. It has been done even for some quantities up to n, 1 over n to the cube. Okay, unfortunately, uh, when I tried to, I, of course, I looked at it because it was, uh, the, the, the one of the expansion starts having some relation with the deviation from, from the mean field theory only for n, let's say, the order of 20 or something like that. But n equals 3. It, yeah, unfeasible. How about 2 plus epsilon expansion? Oh, we have also played with that. That's uh, the, since we have been the one who have uh, quantized, uh, I mean, do the epsilon expansion for the nonlinear sigma model. That's a nonlinear sigma model. Okay, 2 plus epsilon. Uh, and we have tried, uh, I have not reported because no time, uh, we have tried to enforce to take the epsilon expansion coming from 4 minus epsilon and to enforce the function to go through uh, the epsilon expansion near 2. But it's not very good. In fact, uh, we, what we believe, and it's probably true, is that uh, uh, epsilon uh, in 2 plus epsilon, th there is some kind of essential singularity that, uh, and uh, therefore, uh, you, you, the, the function is a function of dimension. When you start from 4, it, ch it changes abruptly when you come close to two dimension. And w when you just uh, make uh, the Borel summation, you, 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 okay, you go something like that, okay? Instead of, so it has to do something like that. And, and when you do it, normally you, you get something like that. So if you try to enforce this sharp turn, then you, 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 you the results for d equals 3 become even worse. And, and at least not better. It's unfortunate because we had immediately this idea that we use nice to, to use a, a 2 plus epsilon expansion also.
Okay, so thank you once more for this fascinating talk.